I was obviously uh, concerned as to where he had the drugs concealed on him because he came over there to, to make the transaction and we just drove up too soon. Korean culture camp when I was a kid was the, my favorite week of the year and I would say it still is. A Tyrannosaurus is what we would call an apex predator. It ate whatever it wanted. It probably didn't get eaten very much. Heroin was a problem years ago, and it, it's obviously come back. It's pretty bad it's all across America. It's hitting small rural areas as just as much as it is in in the bigger cities. My white male, dirty blonde, maybe even reddish tinted hair, low cut. We have a pipeline running through Nash County in I-95. Wow. We have a lot of narcotics that are trafficked up and down the interstate. Oh man, step out for me, I got weed all in here. We're not far from I-40, which runs east and west, coming out from Texas and going out to the coast here in North Carolina. My job is to stop the flow of narcotics into Nash County by making arrests. You ever been in jail? It's not like TV. And investigating the individuals who are trafficking it into Nash County on up the chain. What the f You have to keep the pressure on constantly. I mean, it's a, it's a war. Um, it's a drug war out there. Christina came into the Nashville Police Department with her mother one afternoon, and she was um, obviously needing detox. So did you use heroin? Yes. Heroin, heroin um, proxies. When was the last day to use heroin? Yesterday. Yesterday. And cocaine too? We've had uh, individuals come through our program. We've sent them to detox. They decided at that point they didn't want to follow through with their recovery. They returned to the streets, returned to using again, returned to a life of crime. Mom's here. Christina left the program uh, after 72 hours and she signed a, against medical advice form. We did lose contact with her after that. It's extremely disappointing when an individual leaves under an AMA because we know that their chances of success to sustain their recovery are close to zero. If she does contact us again, we will help her through the process. I, I really do hope she makes it. That's part of it, ain't it? Are we working? Okay, so now he's ready to do something. <laughs> Look, Josh, could you, today when we get to out there, could you see that um, Deputy uh, Stewart could get at least in a position that when I call out a vehicle that we don't let it get away, like two get away? That's kind of hard when your best vehicle you're out there driving is a Tahoe with a dog kennel in the back. Yeah, but if you get... We kind of got screwed a while back and gave up all our good cars. We had this surveillance and now we're stuck with a whole bunch of chargers we're chasing people around and dope. I all right, can I pass vehicle. something by y'all? If you see a vehicle approach a known drug uh, residence, exit that vehicle, one right, passenger, yeah. run up to this residence, you stay two to three minutes, jump back in the truck. Do you need to find a traffic violation? No. My only question is what's your, what's, what's your known drug house? How do you know it's a drug house? That's the thing. Well, what do you mean that's the thing? I don't Wait, know that we've ever stopped a time out in that house. Yes, we did. Did we not start uh, with Cooley uh, that day? Yeah, but we didn't get no dope. We just got a He's a drug dealer. The, uh, Somebody called that car out last time y'all watched his house. Yeah, it was Somebody there, said yeah. that Blair maintenance truck came and left his house. 
I never saw the truck. I tried to find it. I couldn't find it. You're just adding to the probable cause for a K-Mac. Okay, I mean, y'all just ain't. Yeah, but you're not my damn prosecutor, though. If you were, then I'd be talking to everybody with everything. Yeah, but listen, listen. Don't try the cases out there when you're going through it. Use your uh, training and experience. Don't try them. Don't say, well, is this something that the DA's office is going to bless? Do what you think is right based on your training and experience and, and let them worry about that later. I'm in favor of the task force. Uh, I have an officer that works on that task force as well. But the system doesn't differentiate between someone who has an intention of breaking the law and someone who has a disease. So Shelly, just tell me um, why you're here first of all. Um, I'm here, I have trafficking heroin charges. Okay. Basically, I was in a hotel room I went to the room to see some friends and of course to get high and I was in there 15 minutes and the police came knocking on the door and there was a guy in there that had a bunch of drugs and he like set him on the bed and basically the nobody would admit you know whose it was so right. they charged all of us with right. heroin. The trafficking charges are pretty serious. Yeah. Now when you were using how many bags were you using a day? When I started um, IV using, I was doing probably 20 a day, 20, 30. I think I've probably only not been able to help one person uh, that we've gone over there uh, to the jail to work with. And there's a few questions that I usually ask individuals where I can get a pretty good gauge of, of whether or not they're just trying to uh, say the right things and get out of jail um, and not follow through with a treatment plan. And so are you willing to go to a long-term treatment facility? Yes, sir. How long are you willing to go for? Uh, any amount of time. I'm ready to fix my life and, you know. Okay. So most of the places that we recommend individuals to go to are, you know, they're anywhere from six months to two years long. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a problem with any of those. Mm -hmm. okay. Not at all. Um, now, what kind of family support do you have? None right now. And why is that? Because of the drugs. Okay. Were you lying, stealing? No, I've never stolen anything from my family, anything like that. Just They just okay. do not approve of it. Right. Do they understand the, the disease itself, or they just think it was no. a choice you made? Just a choice. Okay. Um, do you talk to any of them? No. For the past 10 years, I've had my own place. I've had a car. I've had everything that I always wanted up until past couple of years, like I've lost everything. I'm down to nothing now. Okay. Did you have a good relationship? my family. I have a twin brother. We've always been really close and he won't even speak to me. He won't even talk to you. Okay. I need you to start working on an autobiography. Anywhere from like three to five pages. It talks okay. about your past drug use and then why you want to stop. Okay. okay. In the meantime, I will get some applications for you to fill out for those facilities. And then if you get accepted, then we'll get a letter from them and then we'll work on through, the, through your attorney to try to get your case handled. Usually, I say usually, they can do a couple things. They can defer your charges until you go complete a program or they could try to get you to plead to a lesser charge, so not trafficking, but you know, possession charge, and then make it part of your probation that you go and complete the program. So there's all kinds of options out there, but like I said, I just need to be patient. Okay. All right. Just arresting people and putting them in jail is not going to solve any problems. They're not getting the help that they need in a jail. And then when they get released, they pretty much go back to using again and committing crimes in the community and not getting their lives uh, back into recovery where they need to be. God love those who have the patience to, to help. I'm very sympathetic, but I'm a cop and I have a different approach and I have a different job. Look, look right and left, because I think he dipped off this road. We ride around uh, the streets of Nash County. Headed back towards Church Street. 
what I would characterize as aggressive patrol, looking for individuals who, based on several characteristics, we pick up on and we're able to tell that they may be about to commit a narcotics violation. She made that first left after she got off of uh, Dexter. I noticed a uh, white female driving a Jeep Cherokee. She looked like she was, I would call it, trolling the streets to look for dealers that would stand out on the street corners. Iramix got her, Jason come up quick in the front. One of my guys pulled up behind her vehicle to approach. As he did, he immediately noticed off to the left side of his vehicle that this individual was coming through what we call the cut in, in between the houses. I felt it was important I go over there and kind of figure out who he was. So, Corey. Yes, sir. Street and Yeah, that's my reason. That's my address now. Now, are you, Corey, let me see before I ask, I'm gonna look myself. Are you on federal probation? Yes, sir. Uh, I was obviously uh, concerned as to where he had the drugs concealed on him because he came over there to, to make the transaction and we just drove up too soon. Open, open it up, bro. He just swallowed that Probably did. He had a rocket. Crack is a beige rock-like substance and it looked like he had some residue on his tongue. And, you know, I basically told him he swallowed it and he denied it. Based off of some other information we received from the female, it was clear, without a doubt, unequivocally, that he was about to make a transaction with her. Man, I was that close. Going back, going back to federal prison. I heard you. I heard you. you hear me? So I'm gonna tell you what, I'm gonna give you a little advice that you probably already know, but if I were you, I wouldn't be hanging over there on Dexter Street. A man just got killed not long ago, right? Okay. Bruh. All right. You know what they say. Catch you later. Get it? I heard, I heard that Get before. It? Get it? I heard that before. Get it? I heard it Catch you later. I ain't got, I'm going to the store. All right. Same way I was going I'll catch you later. All right, bruh. When you program the robots, you have to know how fast the robot rolls, how long you want the robot to roll, and together, how far the robot will roll. My name is Elaine Eckstedt and I am the director of Korean Culture Camp, which is held in Minnesota every summer and has been around for over 40 years. The camp was started in 1977 by uh, parents, mostly Caucasian parents, who had adopted children from Korea. And they wanted their children to feel good about their Korean heritage and to experience Korean culture. So they began a, a summer camp. I was adopted when I was eight months old, uh, so I was always self-conscious about like being a Korean adoptee. But when I like came here, I got to hear and see a bunch of other people who have the same story as I do, and it was really cool because it then helped me accept who I am, and it made me proud to be a, of Korean heritage. I kept volunteering because I wanted to help other kids who may have been like me. And it was also really fun. We had families coming from all over the United States and we still have families that come from out of state. It's a family event. The whole family comes. The parents pay for their children to come, and they come and volunteer. So we, this year we have 235 campers, but we have 250 volunteers to take care of them. 
Most of the volunteers are the parents of the campers. It becomes a whole family experience. Those campers grow up after they're no longer campers, then they become teen helpers. We have 100 teen helpers in our camp this year. And then after they're teen helpers, they can become young adult volunteers. And we actually have people who come back to our camp every year. My name is Kevin Cunningham. I was adopted from South Korea when I was six months old. I've been at Korean Culture Camp for 22 years. Korean Culture Camp when I was a kid was the, my favorite week of the year. And I would say it still is as an adult because now I get to come back and see all the kids doing what I did, going to the class and learning about language, history, and doing Taekwondo together. And of course, eating lunch together was always really fun. Yeah. My name is Hong Ju Lee. I recruit teachers, and most of the teachers are also current teachers at the public school or private school. I love to see those, the kids who are exciting about what they are doing here, what are, what are they learning. Sure. So that's why I've been here for 14 years. That makes me really happy. My daughter now is on the board with, and helps with the leadership of the camp. It's now three generations, and that's true for, for many. Our campers have grown up, and they've gotten married, and they have children. And so our self-esteem classes have changed. It is not so much about adoption anymore. It's about feeling good about being Korean, having a Korean heritage. My name is Cindy Shi and I am the teacher and a leader of Spoke IT Robotics program. Pretty much finished everything. At Spoke IT Robotics, I teach girls how to program using robotics. And I think it's very important for girls to do this because it's an innovative but also very interesting way for girls to program. So um, our Spark IT Robotics program is catered towards girls 10 to 15 years old because I think it's the best time for girls to learn. When you program the robots, you have to know how fast the robot rolls, how long you want the robot to roll, and together how far the robot will roll. Um, so that requires multiplication, mathematics, and a basic understanding of distance and time. Sometimes they're accurate, but sometimes they're not that accurate. Mm -hmm. So when we, ha when we have to program it, we have to like try it out a lot of times. The biggest challenge is that girls uh, have the mental thinking that they are not capable or they are not good or smart enough. Um, and that is definitely not true. And I think that's the main problem that girls have is that they think that technology is often for boys. Well, I've always liked coding and I've done Lego robotics and then when I heard about this program I'm like, wow, coding seems fun. At the end of the program I want the girls to take home the idea that they are good enough and that they are smart and capable, capable enough to pursue STEM and technology in the future. I really want to be a math professor in college. How old are you? I'm eight years old. Well, in, your, in orientation, I have found information that will be really important for me. They're helping us go through all the health insurances and immigration stuff. So, I mean, it's useful to me. <laughs> we actually had someone who was a great... I think the Office of International Student Services really showed that there's a lot to learn, uh, even if you've been living in the United States for a while, just how to adjust to this new uh, intellectual environment. I decided to come to RISE because, well, uh, I, um, I had to take into account different aspects, such as weather. I, I don't like cold weather. It's very hot, very humid. I'm from the north. I was born in the north, so it's a drastic change. Of course, family and friends are a big deal, and you always miss them. But one thing that I miss the most, and that's kind of like my uh, recurrent topic every time I meet, I meet a new person is the weather 
I'm thinking that probably at some point the usual nostalgia about food is gonna kick in, which is probably the most normal thing ever. Uh, Houston, I had heard a lot of great things about Houston. I had not been to uh, this part of the country, specifically uh, Texas. I never knew that I'm coming to Texas. Yeah, <laughs> here I am. I encourage everyone who is considering coming to the States to pursue graduate education to give it a try. The international component of the programs is one of the, one of the main strengths of this country. They do want to have you here. They do want to have international students and American students. They want to get in touch with you. They want to meet you and that's really cool. And I know it's expensive, but if you're smart and you work hard, you can get a scholarship and you might end up here like me without paying not even for your flight. So just go for it. They stand about 16 feet tall and they can weigh anywhere from 5 to 10 tons. This particular specimen uh, is actually a pretty scientifically important specimen. When it was discovered in 1989-1990, um, it was the first specimen where the arm had been known. So we always knew T-Rex had a very small arm, but we'd never really seen it all. So this is the first time we ever saw it. The biggest advances for dinosaur paleontology in the last 20 years have been around the biology of dinosaurs. We've started to understand how to answer questions about how they grew, how they lived, how they ate, all the things that have to do with a living animal. Well, we now are able to look inside the bones of dinosaurs and understand how old these individuals were when they died. And what that gives us is a series of stages of their lifetime. So what we now know is that dinosaurs went through a growth spurt just like humans do. They started out very small, hatched from eggs, and they were teenagers. They grew very, very quickly. By the time they were about 20, they were pretty much full-sized. Uh, and after that, although they you know, got a little bit longer and a little bit taller, mostly they just got bigger. So they would sort of bulk up. A Tyrannosaurus is what we would call an apex predator. It ate whatever it wanted. It probably didn't get eaten very much. Um, it does have these fantastic six-inch teeth that we know were capable of punching through solid bone. So dinosaurs to us now are much more about living animals than they used to be, but that's uh, just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many things we don't know about their biology. Uh, we still don't know what color they were. We don't know the sounds they made. We don't know what they smelled like. Um, all the basic things you take for granted about living animals are actually the hardest things for paleontologists to learn about extinct ones. T-Rex, of course, is, is really the centerpiece of this hall, and it's certainly the centerpiece dinosaur for us. Uh, but we have things that had armor, uh, plant eaters, meat eaters, things that lived 200 million years ago to things that lived only 66 million years ago. So they're going to get a real sense of just how many different kinds of dinosaurs there were on Earth.